Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. This is Holzer's Ghosts Edition. And today it's Death to Tyrants. That's the name of the third episode in season two of the Holzer Files. And if you just tuned in and saw that show, wow, we've got a lot to unpack tonight. If you have not yet watched the Holzer Files season two, episode three, I'm going to just let you know, we're going to talk spoilers. So you're going to get a lot of it up front here. So if you want, you can come check this video out later after you watch the episode. Uh, For those of you listening to the Darkness Radio broadcast of this on Friday, welcome to the program and thank you for joining us. We are always pleased to have you here. We have a very special edition of the program. As I said, during the run of the Holzer Files TV series season two, every Friday we'll be releasing the special audio edition of a live video stream we're doing over on Thursday night on Facebook and uh, our YouTube channel. So this gives us a chance to dig deep into these stories and into the case files. And each week I'm going to bring you a special guest And uh, tonight, we have a very special guest joining us. If you watched tonight's program, uh, you got to know him quite well. He is the current acting director of the Surratt Tavern, the Surratt House Museum, Kobe Treadway. He is with us right now. Kobe, hello and welcome. Hi, Dave. It's good to see you again. Thanks for having me on. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know it's late for you. Um, So you, you got to see the episode first time. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> what do you think of the, uh, of the story and the way we represent the history and the hauntings of the Surratt House? I thought it was I thought it was outstanding. Um, you know, it, it really reflected what we experienced, um, what you guys explained to me. Um, I thought you did uh, a lot of justice to the history. Um, and the comment I said to my wife was I felt like watching the episode that I was uh, I was actually in the old house the whole time. Like I was getting all the feelings that I get when I'm there. So um you captured it. You got it right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, let's for people that um, really are interested in the history as much as I am on this. And this was one of my favorite episodes to go and and get a chance to sit down with you and all the other amazing staff members and historians for the Surratt House and Surratt Tavern. This is a part of history that I never really knew about. It, it kind of got glossed over in a lot of what I was taught when I went to school. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I, I'd like to kind of reintroduce people. So maybe I know you know this story inside and out. Uh, talk to us about the Surratt family prior to the assassination of Lincoln and how this family may have gotten tied in to this story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, it really all goes back to uh, John Sr., you know, the the, the head of the house. Um, John Sr. is the one who purchased the land Um, and built the tavern. Um, And eventually, uh, because he was um, so active as far as agriculture and stuff in the area, and with the tavern at this crossroads, a town built up, and the tavern became the post office. Uh, And so John Surratt Sr. became the first postmaster of what became Surrattsville. Um, And the big thing to remember about John Sr. and the Surratts in general and how they got tied up in with the conspirators is that they were pro-Southern. Um, They were definitely secessionists, um, and John Sr. used his position as the postmaster to funnel information from Washington City, or what we call Washington, D.C. today, to Richmond, and he housed uh, Confederate agents. Um, Basically, it was a safe house. Um, I like to tell kids when they come in, you know, the John Wick movies are so popular, that hotel where John Wick goes with that big gold coin, the Surratt house was kind of like that for Confederate agents. Um, in Southern Maryland. Uh, John Sr. died in 1862, and he kind of passed that on to John Jr. Um, John Jr. became the postmaster, and then he also took over the the running of the Confederate agents. He went a step further um, and became an official agent of the Confederate government. And he's the one who is, uh, he makes the connection between John Wilkes Booth and the rest of the Surratts. Um, so that's the kind of the buildup that that gets you uh, the Surratts on the edge of uh, the conspiracy and the assassination. Now, these rumors that persisted that Edwin Booth, John Wilkes Booth's brother, actually owned this home. Do we know where that began in history or how that tie came? I have no idea. Um, you know, I, I know that people have talked about some of the Millers had said that it could just very well be that they didn't have their history right or they misunderstood 
something. Um, and then it's also possible they were even back then trying to make that that big tie to the booths to, to draw attention. I really don't know because there is no evidence at all to, to suggest that. Well, it goes a long way to show how much people love a good conspiracy theory, right? Absolutely. I, there was definitely a conspiracy to kill the president and <laughs> overthrow him. There was uh, a conspiracy involved in all of this. But was John Wilkes Booth or his brother Edwin actually associated with this home? I guess people just want to feel like there's some kind of attachment. And maybe it's because of the historians that pass this story along. Or perhaps like with Hans Holzer, um, they misunderstood. They thought they were communicating with somebody whose brother uh, they were trying to communicate. And the name John came up, John Wilkes Booth. Edwin Booth fits in with the rumors and and kind of coalesces into this bizarre history that we now know is not true. Mm -hmm. So let's, again, digging and unpacking a little bit more of the history, and then we'll start getting into the creepy hauntings and the strange stuff you and other employees have have experienced there. Um, So the original plan was not to kill Lincoln. The original plan, a lot of people don't know, was to uh, abduct him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the the conspirators were all brought together um, with the idea that they would kidnap the president, um, smuggle him from wherever they managed to kidnap him, and they would get him to the Surratt house. And then from there, they were going to go down to Richmond. Um, And what they wanted to do was kind of use Lincoln as collateral um, uh, and ransom him off for all the Confederate prisoners, Um, because by 1864, there was no longer prisoner exchanges happening. The South was desperate for manpower, and they had all these guys sitting in northern prison camps. So they were thinking maybe they could ransom Lincoln uh, for for these prisoners. And it would also put a uh, – it would damage the federal high command. So uh, snatching him up was the original plan. How did it – pardon the pun – go south? How did it go from abduction to uh, murder? It's uh, – I think what happens is – once the Confederate government falls, Richmond's captured, um, these agents, especially if you buy into the theory that they were operating as Confederate agents, uh, were kind of, um, they were kind of on the lam. They were, they were no longer connected to anything. And so um, they knew that plans had progressed. Capturing Lincoln was no longer going to change anything, but maybe an assassination would buy more time for the South to uh, concentrate what forces it had left. Um, and, and maybe continue the fight. So I think that was the natural progression. Um, and then Booth being disconnected and Surratt Jr. being disconnected, they just went on with the plan um, that they, they kind of formed because fate dropped everything together. So uh, it's just people reacting to situations and, and, and going really drastic. All right, so there was the, this was news to me. I got to be honest, and this is why I love talking to you and the other employees. The passion for the history, uh, the haunting, is definitely something you guys address because you you can't really ignore it, and but you do it with such love and respect. Uh, but the history just drew me in, and this was a, an interesting piece of history I didn't know until I met with you and the staff there. That and and I wanted to ask what your thoughts were on this. Uh, Lincoln, of course, assassinated for many different reasons, but a big part of it they blamed on the fact that he emancipated the slaves. And I'd always had the understanding that the Emancipation Proclamation freed slaves nationwide. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the case, was it? No. um, No, the Emancipation Proclamation was a a political act um, that was done for a couple of reasons. One of the primary reasons was to completely remove any chance of European intervention in the war. Um, but Lincoln could not free. He didn't he didn't want to risk freeing slaves, the enslaved in border states because he did not want to push them into the arms of the Confederacy. So he emancipated all the enslaved in areas that were under federal control and states that were still under rebellion, open rebellion. Um, another effort to try and bring the war to a close. If the Southerners are afraid of losing the enslaved population they have, maybe they'll come to a peace. So yeah, it was never, it was never meant to free everybody. Um, Eventually that would have been the goal, but um, yeah, there were some very serious political uh, considerations behind and and strategic considerations behind that. It was a wartime move. And was this also to kind of break the stranglehold of the South uh, during the war? Because 
uh, by having these enslaved people under their uh, rule, it, it gave them more manpower. Whereas if the freedom came, there was less people to stand for the South. Was that any aspect of this? And, and is that why it was so important for them to try to stop the president and, and break this code that he had already begun? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, for sure, he's considering the idea that most of the fortifications and the supply logistic networks are being operated by enslaved individuals so that frees up a whole lot more white southerners uh, to fight in the army. Um, so you're definitely going to deal a serious blow to manpower and the economy of the South. Um, you know, there, um, James Swanson, who's the author of um, Manhunt, he theorizes that Booth kind of goes off the rails and decides he wants to murder Lincoln when he hears Lincoln make a speech about offering suffrage to African-American men, to former enslaved men. Um, and that that was just kind of the sign that things were really changing um, and, and that slave system that the country had embraced for so long or had dealt with for so long was ending. Um, so you could definitely see how there would be a movement to assassinate Lincoln as a result of that, but the argument can be made. I want to go on record as saying I'm not trying to discredit the good work that President Lincoln did, nor am I trying to say that he was only trying to free the slaves in the South. His, his kind of concept was by releasing and freeing these slaves, the enslaved people, that that would then, uh, the people in the North, the people that were part of his belief system would would relinquish control over the enslaved people as well in their territories. So it was kind of this domino effect he was going for. It wasn't that he was picking sides. Well, the North can keep enslaved people and the South must, must give them up. That was, that was not the case. Correct. Right. I mean, you can see, you see that happening here in Maryland, actually, you know, the emancipation is passed and then Maryland passes its own emancipation in November of 1864. So, um, you, you see the dominoes falling. Uh, Lincoln was smart. He was a politician and he, he knew how to play the game. And, and uh, you know, he he did what he did for very strategic and, and deliberate purposes. Now, let's let's talk a little bit more about the story, um, because, you know, again, Lincoln's assassinated. That's really all I remember growing up. I didn't realize that there were other attacks that mm -hmm. were being plotted. It was almost like 9-11. There were independent attacks taking place to try to just reduce the government in a shock and awe campaign. Who else was attacked? Um, Edwin Stanton is the big one. Um, Edwin was attacked in his bed by Lewis Powell, who was one of the conspirators. Um, he had Stanton had been in a horrible carriage accident um, and was laid up in bed. He was convalescing. Um, so everybody knew where he was. Um, and um, he was attacked by Lewis Powell with a, well, it was supposed to be a pistol. Powell encounters um, Stanton's son on the stairway going up to the bedroom. Um, he goes to pull the trigger on his pistol to kill Frederick Stanton. It misfires. So instead, he hits him upside the head with the butt of it so hard that it actually breaks the pistol um, and fractures Frederick's skull. They actually thought Frederick would die. Um, and then Powell charges into Stanton's bedroom with a Bowie knife, um, fights off a Union veteran who had been wounded, who was helping Stanton um, and then attacks Stanton uh, and disfigures him. He, he slices his face so bad that he's scarred for the rest of his life, Stanton is. Um, and then he stabs a servant and another one of Stanton's sons. So the investigators, when they show up at Stanton's house, say that it looks like a slaughterhouse. There's just blood everywhere. Um, uh, so so I that one, Stanton convalescing from injuries, he gets attacked. His face is like, this guy is like the Terminator. He's yeah. not down. He doesn't die. He doesn't. Um, you know, as as weak as he was, he was able to fend off the blows from Powell and then he rolled himself off the bed. But you can imagine, I mean, his face, his jaw was broken from the carriage accident. So he's that's not going to feel very good. But um, I think even more about that, that Union soldier who was convalescing from a wound of his own. And um, Powell was six foot two. He's he's he, you know, he would be a a pretty impressive specimen for us to look at today. You know, you can imagine seeing him as a safety or something out on the football field. So um, that this wounded guy without any weapons attacked him and was able to buy enough time for Stanton to roll away and then force Powell to leave uh, the room is pretty impressive. So you've, again, you've got these coordinated attacks. Uh, John Wilkes Booth goes in um, successfully shoots president Lincoln, makes an escape uh, by leaping from the balcony 
landing on the stage where it's believed that he broke his leg. And is that when he yells the death to Tyrant statement? You got two. He either yells it when he lands on the stage or he yells it right before he jumps out of the presidential box. Um, but yeah, six Semper Tyrannis and uh, and then he runs off the stage and, and flees out the back end of Ford's theater. And this is where the story picks up again for the Surratt family in the tavern. Now, at this time, John Surratt Sr. is is passed. John Surratt Jr., a sympathizer and uh, working behind the scenes to help this cause, they have created a bit of a safe house. They've, they've hidden guns in the walls and under floorboards. They've provided provisions. And do they know that John Wilkes Booth is is on route to them to try to escape? So there's a guy who's renting the tavern from Mary in 1865. His Mary at that time is living in Washington, D.C. in a boarding house. Uh, his name is, remember that, folks. At this point, it's being rented by somebody else. Mary's in a totally different place, totally yeah. different place. Yeah, that's a big thing to, to, to fall back on to. Um, this guy's name is John Lloyd. So here's another John to confuse all the Johns. John Lloyd was a former police officer. He's renting this country tavern. It's kind of like his retirement. Mary, according to Lloyd, um, delivered a message to him earlier um, in the day of Lincoln's assassination to tell him to have the supplies ready because parties would be calling on the tavern that night to retrieve them. Um, now, there's no indication that he knew it was Booth who was coming. But he obviously knew what the supplies were because he pulled out the two carbines, um, which is a, a it's a short rifle, um, some rope and some whiskey and a package that Mary had dropped off, which ended up being some field glasses, binoculars um, meant for Booth. Um, so uh, Lloyd may not have known. Probably he did know, but he may not have known, according to his testimony, who was coming. But he knew what the supplies were. And so when. Uh, Booth and David Harold, one of the other conspirators, show up at the tavern. Um, Harold knocks on the door and John Lloyd answers it, brings him in, says, be a few minutes. I'm going to go grab those supplies. Uh, and he gets the carbines and brings them out there into the tavern to, to David Harold. And then they go into the yard to talk to Booth. So um, Lloyd knew enough to know where the supplies were hidden uh, and, and to have them ready. So, All right. And. After this, he's he's leg is broken. I, I believe he didn't even dismount, right? He never went into the tavern. He didn't. And he goes to meet with Mud, the doctor who's going to try to fix him up, and then tries to make his escape. Correct. Okay. So that's pretty much, in effect, a very short, brief time. How long is John Wilkes Booth outside the Surratt Tavern? Our best guess is about seven minutes. Seven minutes. That's it. Tied to this to this tavern, to this family. Now, Mary Surratt and her family, because it's their tavern, gets twisted into this as well. And she becomes the first woman to be hanged uh, and put to death in our country. Is that correct? Um, by the federal government. So, I, I mean, obviously right. state governments have done it. But, yeah, she is the first. And she's only one of two. There have only been two women executed by order of the federal government. So. Wow. And her association with this case and Anna, the daughter, what do we know about their understanding of this? Were they complicit in any way, shape or form or uh, no, they were living a life in DC and, and separated from all of this. So it's the million dollar question, right? Um, what did Mary know? What was she involved in? I can tell you for a fact, Anna didn't know anything. Um, that was easily determined that Anna was in the dark um, and they probably purposely kept it that way. Um, but Mary, when I look at the evidence and the research that I've done, um, I think Mary was involved for sure in the kidnapping plot. Um, I, I, she had to know what John Jr. was involved in because he took over for John Sr. and she knew what he was involved in. Mary was a pro-Southerner. Um, she was very much against Abraham Lincoln and his policies. Uh, and then I think one of the, the biggest... Um, pieces of evidence against Mary comes later on when she's finally arrested. Um, when she's being arrested, Lewis Powell, the man who attacked Stanton, he never did leave DC because he didn't know his way out of the city. So he hid uh, in a tree in a courtyard, a secluded courtyard for a couple of days. And then he goes to the boarding house where Mary is living. Uh, and he shows up with the world's worst timing because federal <laughs> agents are there to arrest Mary. And he walks in and it kind of unravels from there. Mary will go on to say she doesn't know who he is. 
she didn't he's trying to pawn himself off as a worker who's going to dig a gutter for her um, or a ditch is what we call today she said i don't know this guy well they go and they get interviewed and anna of all people says well yeah that's um he rented a room from from my mother he stayed at the boarding house um we know who that is and uh so they catch mary in the lie um and, and so i think that's one of the the bigger pieces of evidence against her and then you have lloyd's testimony you know she did she tell him to have those supplies ready she, there's a pretty credible witness saying that she gave um a message to lloyd to that effect so i think she's involved whether or not she knew they were going to murder lincoln uh, you know, uh, I don't know, but you don't have to be found guilty of murder to be a part of that conspiracy. So I think she was definitely involved. The last bit I'll touch on with the history of that is obviously you have John Jr. takes flight, right? Mm -hmm. You've got other people that take flight. Um, some of these people end up avoiding real justice. The people truly involved in this assassination, uh, murder attacks, and uh, abduction scenario, some just wait out the law and yeah. get away with it. Meanwhile, Mary Surratt is hanged for this crime. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, there's a comment. A lot of people will say, um, you know, John Jr. Let his mother hang. Um, had he come back or turned himself in, it would have saved her life. Um, I think that's probably very unlikely. Had he come back, there just would have been an extra noose on the gallows. Um, but John Jr. is the big one. I mean, he, <laughs> He was one of the two leaders of the conspiracy. Um, Samuel Mudd, Dr. Mudd, made the introduction of Booth to Surratt Jr. because Surratt Jr. had the connections with the Confederate government and because he was familiar with the area and he had the tavern. So John Jr. is that one conspirator who got away because he does flee, um, like Colleen was saying in the show, and he ends up in Italy. He's arrested, brought back and tried. But unlike Mary uh, and the other conspirators who are tried by a military tribunal, he gets a civilian trial because the war is completely over. Um, and of course, he's tried by a jury of his peers. So his peers said, no, he wasn't even in town. So he couldn't have been part of the murder. We don't know what to do with it. Yeah, he was going to be part of the kidnapping, not part of the murder. Hung jury. So, yeah, he got away. And uh, that's that's the big misjustice there. Very strange. So that's just an overview of the history. Now we start examining the hauntings yeah. of this uh, home and I'll take some of your questions. I, I'm going to, I've got them scrolling on the side. I want to thank everybody. And as you saw, Kobe, as you were talking, how many people love the history angle of, of this story. And we can't ignore um, the history before we dive into the haunting, which we always knew is really important to Dr. Holzer to try to understand history and to get history right. So right. now that we've kind of um, broken into that, let's uh, start to talk about some of the experiences. Now, how far back in history do we have reports of a haunting taking place at Surratt Tavern, at the Surratt Park Museum? It definitely goes back to the early 1900s. Um, you know, the, we don't have an exact date, but we know that families living there between the late 1890s and the early 1900s um, are experiencing noises and weird feelings. Um, and, and, and so you see that's pretty steady um, through the people that have lived there or else eventually worked there. Um, so at least as early as the um, 1900s, at least. Now, when it became, in my understanding, became a museum in the 60s, families right. owned it through the 40s up to the 60s. Right. And some of the families experienced strange hauntings and things there. But once it, it became a museum, they, as most museums do, they kind of stray away from that aspect of the paranormal. Again, because you guys are Maryland provincial life, you don't necessarily want to play up the the dark side. Many people leave ghosts are associated with the demonic realm, and they're not truly the spirits of deceased, but they're dark angels or demons or whatever you want to uh, apply to them. So many people don't talk about it. But when it's a museum in the 60s, 70s, and it, it begins, do the hauntings subside or do they continue? Uh, so the best to my understanding is that they just keep on going. Um you know, it's funny. Um, we, you mentioned the director, the former director in, in the in the uh, show, and she wouldn't talk about it, I think, because she didn't like to think about it. Um, but she had a couple of good stories um, about being locked in a bathroom when she was the only one in the building. Um, 
feeling like there was somebody standing behind her all the time and, and looking at her. So, um, you know, I think from the 60s and 70s, maybe they kept it quieter than we tend to do now. But when you look back at the 60s and 70s and we, you know, paranormal has come so far just in my lifetime about if it's OK to talk about and, and really consider seriously. So um, I think we're seeing people more and more comfortable talking about it today than than they would have been 40, 50 years ago. And now when we talked with you, you had only been there for eight months. Now eight. you're you're closing in on a year, correct? More so, yeah. I'm, I passed it in August. So, yeah. Well, happy anniversary. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Obviously, we talked to you because, as you heard from many of the employees during the episode tonight, Toby uh, was kind of the catalyst, the poltergeist agent. Mm -hmm. That Although the haunting has always been there, things began to amp up when Kobe joined in. We'll continue speaking about that and discuss more when we return. Stay tuned. You're listening to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Holzer's Ghosts, Death to Tyrants, the after show for the Holzer Files. You're listening to Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the program. This is Darkness Radio presents Holzer's Ghosts as we look at Death to Tyrants Season 2, Episode 3, and our guest tonight, Kobe Treadway. And uh, Kobe is a, an integral part of the Strat Tavern. You're also a, a teacher. Yeah. So that's why you are so eloquent at, at helping us to understand and share this history. And from all of our listeners uh, on the side, scrolling their, their points here, they're enjoying this part of the history as much as what we're going to get into. Mm -hmm. let's, let's dive into your aspect of the haunting. And then I have something really kind of bizarre to share with you okay. uh, as well after our visit. So you're, you come on, you've lived in that area. Are you familiar with the haunting of the Surratt house? Not familiar with the haunting at all. Familiar with the history. Um, you know, there's always that little tickle in the back of your head that a historic site is going to have something like that. And I mean, it's an unsettled place uh, as far as the history goes. So um, going into it, I was like, you know, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if uh, something's going on there, um, but never really heard anything about it. So uh, it was pretty much walking in and experiencing it. Well, here's a good question to start off with. Uh, John Hawkins says, Kobe, have you ever thought you might be a medium, <laughs> only not really understanding your gift since you have had so many strange experiences? That's a pretty good question, Kobe. It's Are a you really great question. And it's something I've considered actually um, after the show, um, during the reveal, Cindy mentioned something similar um, that if, if nothing else, that she got a feel from me that I was very sensitive to it. Um, so, uh you know, maybe I am and I just don't know it. Um, you, you know, I, I've always been very much in tune with the feelings around me and, and things that are happening. So uh, it's wholly possible. <laughs> All right. So how, how soon into working there do you get the um, get the uh, first paranormal experience? Uh, within two weeks. And within do you realize it's a paranormal experience at the time? I didn't. Or is still working foreground and dismissing these weird things. I think it was probably still just kind of dismissing it. Um, you know, uh, maybe it's the sounds of an old house that I wasn't used to yet. Um, maybe it's just the, the feeling of being on a site where history happened. You know, um, I can be a little bit of a romanticist that way you go to a historic site and they, they, you know, they have a feel to them. Um, but then, uh, you know, I started to get used to the noises of the house and then realized that those were not house noises that I was that I was hearing. And those were not just uh, nostalgic feelings for history that I was feeling. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, I would say with by the time a month was up, I was starting to come home and, and, and talking to my wife and, and, and saying, you know, there's uh, something going on with this house. Uh, that's that's what, what was your wife's response? Well, she just laughed about it. Uh, she's like, you know, you, you're just being dramatic and, and things like that because she's really, uh, she was really not a believer um, uh, for a while there. Um, I say for a while there because she is now after being in the house herself. But um, yeah, it, you know, so you just, you, you always worry that people are going to not take you seriously and, and just joke it off. But the more I talk to some of the volunteers that work there, the more, 
my experiences were jiving with some of the things they weren't really sharing out loud. And I realized, wow, there's something really going on. And then I heard the growl, um, you know, that we all mentioned. And that was, that was the, that was probably the last domino that fell. Once I heard that growl, I was like, there's no logical explanation for this other than what I just heard. So you know, here's, here's an interesting question and I'll throw this out there. Um, you know, you felt this connection to the Surratt home. You felt uh, just, you felt drawn there. You told me in between the scenes. Mm-hmm. TJ Davis says, uh, any chance Kobe reminds the spirits of someone from the past? Maybe he has the same energy, uh, someone that, you know, of someone that lived there in the past. Uh, what do you think? Could you be the reincarnation of uh, of one of the spirits there? I mean, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm open-minded enough to never say no to things like that. Um, you know, one of the things about uh, the staff who work there is that we do dress in, in period clothing. So, you know, there is that aspect, um, that comes involved. Um, I've always been told I had an old soul, so it's holy, you know, maybe there's something to that. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I would never no, I'm where you are with this. I love it. Yeah. So you know, uh, you never Karen know. And Pasha says, what, what experience did your wife have? Uh, so she, she heard the growl. Um, and this was months after I had heard it. Um, and we were, you know, it was the first time she'd really had a chance to come to the house and we were in different rooms cause I was kind of closing the building down and she, <laughs> she, um, she was in the kitchen wing. And I had just been going to join her and I heard the growl Um, and she heard it and I could tell she heard it. She got really still. And then she turned and she looked at me and uh, I didn't ask her until later. I was like, so what did you hear in the kitchen on the ride home? And she was like, I heard a growl. And ever since that moment, she's she doesn't question me at all. So she she heard the growl, too. And I love she's her question popped up or comment popped up. I remember when you called me one morning while you were opening up the house. Yeah, and that's actually my this is more embarrassing. That's my mother. Um oh, your mother <laughs> okay. that one. Yeah, that was probably the 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 one experience um that ties into the one where I heard the footsteps coming down while I was opening up the bar side um and felt that cold draft and feeling like something had walked past me. Um, I went to go open the upstairs portion of the house and I hit that landing, um, at the top of the the first flight of stairs. And I just froze there because all the hair on my neck and arms went up. It was just super unsettling. Um, and my wife's a teacher, so I couldn't call her and my brother was at work and I was just like, I need to call somebody cause I don't want to be alone in this. So I, I called my mother. <laughs> you called mommy. I called mom. And um, then what happened while we're investigating, we get a DVP direct voice phenomena of the voice saying, mother mother so maybe it was just you we heard your your residual fear you called mommy i got gotcha. you yeah uh, that you know maybe my voice hit that that pitch too mommy. <laughs> reality remixer is asking is it pre-recorded on facebook yes it is you've just time slipped into our realm uh no this is live every thursday after the holzer files airs on travel channel you can join me here on our social media, Facebook, and on our YouTube channel. We'll have special guests from every episode. Our guest tonight is Kobe Treadway, and Kobe is uh, the director at the Surratt uh, Tavern, Surratt House Museum. Um, You know, I know a lot of people want to know since our visit, and I've seen some of the questions scrolling. If I haven't gotten to them yet, I apologize. Try to re-message me, and I'll put them up if I can. Um, Has the activity continued? since we left it has um now obviously with covid and and the lockdowns and stuff that maryland's gone through i haven't been able to be in the building as much as previously um but you know i i try to get in there you know once a week and um there was maybe about a month ago a new employee and i went in there to do some serious cleaning and um you know the noises were back the shadow figures um that creepy feeling vibe um, that is the house was all still there, but a little bit of overdrive. It was almost like they were like, Hey, we missed you. Welcome back. And uh, you know, we're still here sort of thing. So um, at this point, it's almost a comforting feeling. Um, 
I haven't really felt the real negative um, stuff going on like I had been before you guys came. Okay. Which is nice. It's, uh, right. it's kind of comforting. Um, but uh, definitely no, still. We attribute a lot of that to the fact that the spirits have had lies told for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, history gets lost by representing the story, telling it as we promised we would. Sometimes it seems to settle things down because those ghosts got acknowledged. Mm -hmm. They were talked about. And with that, that'll lead me to my story for you. Okay. Now, after we left and we, we had other episodes to film, Cindy being a medium is tied into mediumship all around the world. She works with different uh, countries, different practitioners. Uh, she's always learning and, and honing her craft. And she was contacted by a friend of hers in Indonesia. Now, contractually, we can't talk about these episodes. Mm -hmm. We can't talk about our experiences, where we've gone. We can't talk about anything until it's ready to air. So Cindy doesn't talk to anybody. And out of the blue, her friend contacted her and said, um, I need to speak with you. Uh, uh, there's a spirit following you. And my son, who is a spirit artist, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing the story. I'm not as eloquent at telling it as Cindy is, is a spirit artist. And he drew a sketch. And he said, this spirit has been following you uh, for a while now and is still attached to you. And Kobe, I'm going to just throw up this picture uh, that was drawn in comparison to a picture we showed tonight. <laughs> what do you think? Anna Surratt. Yeah, it looks a lot like her. Uh, for those of you listening to the podcast version of this, I'll have the photograph up at darknessradio.com. Click on the news tab and you'll see this image, uh, the drawing from a man in Indonesia who was picking up on a spirit attached to Cindy Keza. And you can see next to it the portrait of Anna Surratt, and that is, we believe, we came into contact with during our investigation. That's and people always ask, "Are you are you ever followed home?" And apparently, Cindy was by Anna Surratt for a while. Wow, that's uh, incredible. She she goes about cleansing and clearing and making sure that you know she doesn't carry the baggage of spirits with her often. But she was surprised, and when she saw that image, immediately it resonated with her. That's Anna Surratt. She mm -hmm. knew it. I see in the picture, and when she looked at that photograph that we had, it blew her away. Yeah. But uh, what's your impression? You see that I'll pop it up again for you and for the audience. What? Look at yeah, that. I mean, that's it's crazy. It's it's incredible that somebody would draw that without having seen the picture. Um, you right. know, and even the time period, and, and of course, as a historian and me and the, the material culture and stuff. But the dress in the the picture that's drawn looks a little bit later Victorian, but obviously still within Anna's range and. Uh, you know, it's, it's, that's pretty crazy. Um, and now get, I get worried because does that mean there's something following me home? <laughs> well, well you, you'll have to follow back up with us and let us know how that goes for you. Let me uh, pull up questions again here. Cause I know we had quite a few that were coming up. Um, uh, oh yeah. Cameron pops in and says, I know Cindy's Indonesian friend, Sarah, she is the real deal as a psychic. Uh, Trina looking at the picture says, that's amazing. Wow. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, Mary Ellen says, well, you just have to love the paranormal and we certainly do. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder what else Cindy, or uh, wonder what else Anna had to say to Cindy. You know, a lot of people want to know if there's things that don't make the episodes and from uh, time to time, there are different aspects of the story. As you heard tonight, Kobe spent the first 25, 30 minutes just catching us up on the history. We've got to do these parcels to tell you little slices of the history at the beginning of the show, show how it weaves into the narrative of our history and what we're exploring and finding. And, you know, we're filming. You can attest to this, Kobe. People don't ever believe it. But when we go, we're there for five days. Yes. And we're there 12 to 15 hours a day filming and breaking down the history, getting it right, talking to numerous people. Some make it on camera, some don't. Some just are there to give us the history or the background and, and, and point us in some directions. So that's how it really kind of unfolds. Um, but you can attest, I mean, we were thorough. Yes. In our examination. Yeah, no, you guys were, I mean, you left no stone unturned. Every corner was checked. I mean, it was impressive watching you guys work. And uh, the day that you put in, the night that you put in, and put it that way. Um, those were some long nights. They were fun, but they were long. <laughs> Jason Howard asks, Dave, what did you see from your angle during the seance? Well, 
During the seance scene, Jason, as you saw, the three of us were holding hands at this table. Our concept was people had held seances there before. And not everyone is proficient at closing a seance. Um, so we wanted to try to open up to the spirits, then close that circle. And we did it with love and respect, hoping that we could kind of, by setting our intent, close all previous circles that had been opened in that home. And when we were holding hands, first of all, there was that wild flicker of the the candle, which was very still for most of it. And then to hear that, we heard DVP, direct voice phenomena. And we couldn't hear exactly what it said because it caught us off guard in the moment. But you hear this out loud in the room right by me. And at one point, Shane turns and looks at the door because he can hear footsteps. And if you listen, you can hear footsteps in the hall. Shane turns and looks while he's holding hands and then turns back to the circle. And that, I think, is when you see the thing appear around the corner and pop back to hear claims of people seeing things and to have actually captured on camera. Kobe, I have to ask, what was that like for you tonight to see that? Oh, um, I mean, that was it was incredibly unsettling. Um, you know, the goosebumps all popped up. Um, you know, I hadn't seen it since the reveal. So seeing, you know, I, I kind of had forgotten what it looked like. And so seeing that again, um, it just, uh, I see somebody saying they had full body chills and, and it was exactly what I felt the second time seeing it was just like, um, I didn't believe my eyes when you, when you revealed it to me, i I did not believe it. And the whole drive home, I went through all these different scenarios in my head to try and explain it. Like, you know, all the logical things that we do. Um, and I just could not, I, I still can't believe that that was that, that we saw that. Um, yeah, it still shakes me. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it seems so, so much full of substance too. Um, you know, some of the shadowy figures and things you see are so transparent and wispy like, but that seems so solid and so real. Uh, and, and the way that it plays out, um, the flicker, the voice, the, the movement coming around the door jam. I mean, ugh. we couldn't physically see anything with our eyes. So from my vantage point, it was exactly as you saw tonight, I'm facing my two compatriots the door is off to my side and behind me a little bit. I heard the voice, which sounded like it was right there between Shane and I. And that's why I looked kind of startled and surprised. And we we're all like, what the? And, uh, you know, there was a, I, I hate to say, I don't, I didn't feel a dark presence myself in that house, but I definitely felt a strong presence and sadness. And I'm not a psychic or a medium at all. Um, during the, the episode, Cindy, when she was tapping in, talked about, um, I was dead. And, and the question from Ken is, did Cindy say Anna was dead before Lincoln was killed? And who then did John kill that she knew about? I think Cindy was saying that the spirit was just communicating with her that she was dead, uh, that because of this, uh, tragedy and atrocity, that's what cost her her life is what I'm understanding. Um, ben Kerr asks, are people still uncomfortable in the slave quarters? What do you make of that? Um, you know, that space itself is unsettling. Um, whether or not it was a where enslaved lived or if um, the woman who was enslaved named Rachel, um, whether she lived in there after she was freed and was a, a working employee, uh, there's something about that space that's very unsettling. Um, you know, that you, most of my volunteers will feel something in there. Um, it's also where they hid the guns. So, you know, there's, there's even an element of that to it. So there's something going on in there. Um, and most people feel it. Ashley uh, Jaeger uh, or Jagger says, did you get more information from the investigation that you didn't know? And I don't know if this is meant towards you or to me, but I will say, yes, the more we uncovered every day is is like a, a Christmas day for me. I get to open up a present and uncover new information. I have what Hans Holzer had. I've, of course, read many different books on Lincoln and the assassination. I've watched documentaries, but we talked about it in the first half an hour of, of this broadcast. Some of the history I didn't know or understand. But for you, Kobe, mm -hmm. with what we were able to uncover and with the haunting was, were there new elements to this story that that came out to you as well? Um, I think, you know, I hadn't known about the seance 
that had been done before. Um, I mean, I found out about that while you guys were there too in your work. So um, hearing that was a kind of a big one for me um, because it, it helped explain the different feelings that I was getting in the house um, where sometimes it'd be very negative and sometimes more comforting or more just, you know, the normal everyday feeling of, of the house, feeling something was there, but not negative. Um, you know, I learned a lot about things that happened in the house um, after the Surratts were gone. We don't focus a whole lot on that. So um, learning about uh, some of the people who lived there afterwards, that there was a guy there who um, worked at the fire department across the street and he was responding to a call. And while he was running across the street, he got hit and killed by a car. Um, you know, I had no Maybe idea that. about that. I don't remember if his name was John. You never know. I mean, it, it would be par for the course if it was. Um, I'd have to to go back and look at the the notes that I wrote down to remember his name. But, you know, so it's the, to see that tragic things were happening in the house, around the house, even after the Surratts were gone, um, was kind of uh, a little bit of an eye opener for me. All right. Uh, let me see. We've got some more questions coming in. How old was Anna? Let's see if we can pull this up. Uh, Kayomi says, how old was Anna when she lost her mother and brother? Good, good question. Um, Anna was 21, 22 years old. So um, a lot older than we think based off of her behavior in the in the testimonies. Um, she comes across very immature, but she was actually about 22. 22 years old, right? And the voice, at first when we heard that, it sounded so childish to me. But again, it, it also has that kind of genteel, proper upbringing mother. It's, mm -hmm. it's just that kind of succinct way of speaking. Um, Reality Remixer says, thank you, Kobe, for being here with us tonight. I have to agree with that. Thank you so much for doing this mm -hmm. with us. Um, let me see. There we go. Were you able to, Libby wants to know, were you able to close the seance? Cindy mentioned that it was left open. Can it be closed? Uh, it, the original seances, we believe, were left open because of the stories we heard. People would get freaked out and run out um, and, and leave. That's why we wanted to do a seance together. And next week on, on our episode in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Libby, we, we go to the um, uh, Franklin Castle. And it is a crazy story steeped in legend and lore. And we go in to investigate, and uh, this uh, this this spirit board back here makes a guest appearance next week. And I know a lot of people are going to be up in arms. You brought a Ouija board to a ghost? What the hell? You know, you've opened up the seventh portal to hell. And uh, listen, if I didn't open up the seventh portal to hell in my first marriage, it'll never happen. That's all <laughs> I can say. Um, but uh, we bring the Ouija board in because... Um, things had happened in the past. And again, we wanted to set the intent to try to set them right. So I hope you'll tune in to find out. And uh, next week's episode is a very powerful, very impactful episode. Probably one of the most emotional roller coasters I've ever been a part of on any of these episodes. So make sure you tune in next week. And this I can promise you. Each episode, this series, you've, we're now in episode three, Death to Tyrants. Uh, Kobe Treadway, our guest tonight, uh, each episode has has revealed really unbelievable and beautiful evidence that we've been able to collect. And next week, hands down, is, in my opinion, one of the best evidence catch ever on any show you've ever watched. We capture something that still blows my mind. I've watched this scene thousands of times in evidence review and since, because I just can't wrap my head around how beautiful this moment was and what we were able to capture. So if you've enjoyed what you've seen up to this point, and this is not taking or detracting anything away from the episode you watched today of uh, Death to Tyrants, episode three of season two, but the next week's episode, like I said, each story evolves and has its own flavor and slant to it. And, and as much as I love the rich history, Next week, we look at a totally different angle of history and how history gets twisted by perceptions and people retelling tales that have smidgens of truth, but not necessarily the full truth associated with it. And the spirits demand to be heard. And uh, uh, the case is powerful. Um, my daughter, Ripley, uh, helps us remotely uh, with the investigation. So it's a great episode. Make sure you check that out next week. Um, let's see. We've got a couple more comments. Erica says, so excited for next week. Look forward to seeing it. 
Uh, will there be any upcoming poor Shane moments? Of course. We wouldn't be holding your files without a couple of hashtag poor Shane moments, but I promise you there are a few poor Dave and poor Cindy moments this season as well. It was evenly matched because, um, you know, when we started our, our series this year, uh, it was before the um, COVID crisis. And then COVID struck and places were shut down for three to four months. And the spirits seemed very hungry and wanted to be heard and seen again. And uh, that kind of brings me to a question to you then, Kobe. You go back in the house and we're uh, this lifeblood of people constantly coming through the museum and visiting and learning history and, and the employees coming and going. By pulling them out, do you notice a different sense to the house now? I do. Um, I. It's hard to put it into words. You know, I always struggle to try and say it the right way. Um, but it, it it feels a little a little more subdued. It okay. feels like there's more there. Um, like they're they're saying, "Hey, hey, hey, we're still here," but it, it doesn't seem to be ratcheted up as high as it was. Um, now, of course, having gone in there with other people um, on the site who are volunteers or, or staff, when we go in there, um, if they've been in there without me, they still say that when I go in there with them, it's it's a higher experience than than when they go in there without me. So. Um, I still have no answer for that. Why do you think spirits um, are so drawn to you when you're in that home? Is it because I, I, here's my belief and I'm going to throw this at you. I think we talked about it when we were there, your passion and love for this house, the history and the people that live there is very uh, easy to see um, very prevalent. And, and I think the spirits see that. And because you're there to tell the truth and you are, man, you, all of the employees, I got to be honest with you, all the employees were quick to correct us when we said things improperly or misunderstood history. They were there to correct us, put us right back on the right path, direct us to somebody that might have a better answer for us. And I think the spirits know that. And because you have this, this, uh, you're a teacher, you've got this connection, you've got this ability to speak on their behalf. I think that's why the spirits are so intrigued and and make themselves known to you. What do you think? Um, I mean, I love that theory. Um, I think it's a great theory. Um, I would agree with that. I think a lot of it has to do with how open I am to wanting to tell the story. Um, I come, you know, I also come in with a really open mind and, and, and um, I come in looking to fix what's, what's been mistold. Um, so I do think that that's a part of it for sure. Um, uh, and, and honestly, it has nothing to do with that large pentagram tattoo on your chest and the, and the chicken blood you kept drinking though, right? Yeah, no, nothing to do with any of that. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, uh, I think, I mean, I really, when you broached that theory with me before, I really liked that theory because it, it's a, it's a comforting thought, you know, that they're reaching out because they feel like they have somebody who, who can make them heard. Um, and, and to me, that's what it's all about. Listen, I know you and I are both about saving history. Uh, the Surratt House uh, Museum, not having the attention, not having the people go through. What can, what can all of these amazing viewers and listeners from around the world do to help maintain it um, and help with raising funds for it? Is there a place to make donations on the website? Um, not yet. Um, we are doing, we are putting together virtual programs, um, that, that we've been running through the commission. Um, you know, we're doing okay right now, uh, as far as all that goes. Um, the one thing I would say is, um, you know, if you go on Facebook and you look at PG Parks history, um, you'll find stories and things that, that we're doing on the site, um, to try and, and keep engaging people. Um, and so the more response we get, the more leeway we have to do more going back out to you. So that's, that's the big thing right now. So, um, you know, we're trying to reach anybody and everybody we can. So if you see something you like, the best thing you can do is comment on it, like it and share it because then we can show that, um, to our higher ups and they can see that, you know, we're still relevant. Um, and, and that's what's helping us right now is that we're proving we're still relevant and engaging the community and, and the world at, at large. So. Well, with that being said, obviously you're relevant. Um, 
are you open during regular seasons? Do you do ghost walks and ghost tours? Can people come in there and investigate? It has never been done before, but we had never had a paranormal investigation come in to the site before either. So um, I would love to see a future in it. Um, I would love to see it happen. Uh, of course, right now we are not open um, to the public. Um, uh, PG County, where we're located, Prince George's County, is a really high um, positive. Um, test rate. Um, and and it, it, so many people come in from DC and everywhere else that the, the population there is um, tricky as far as COVID goes. But um, man, once once we get the green light and we start operating, this is something that I want to, to move along. Um, I think that there's a lot that can be done. Um, and uh, I don't think we should be shutting ourselves off from it anymore. I agree. Uh, do we know anything about the home that uh, Mary Surratt lived in uh, prior to her um, being put to death? The H Street boarding house, um, it still exists. It's in Washington, D.C., and it is a Chinese restaurant that is called the Walk and Roll. Um, yeah, the Walk and Roll. So there is a little marker that designates it as a as a spot where um a history happened, but if you go inside of it, nothing's left as far as you know what it would have looked like in the 19th century. Do they ever talk about it being haunted? Do you know any any of that? I haven't heard too much about it. There are some people who I've talked to who said that it feels weird, um, but never really beyond that. Um, I'll be honest; I don't know that anybody's ever really seriously gone in there looking for it. Um, I, I mean, I've heard the food is really good and. I think the that's what a lot of people are focused on. But I've been told if you go in and ask for the uh, combo platter six six six, they'll take you in and tell you all the haunted history. Maybe I'll give that tell a try. Them, tell them Kobe Treadway sent you. Sent you. That's it. <laughs> are there any relics? Ryan wants to know: Are there any relics or items in the museum that could cause the excess energy for spirits to communicate, other than the double sided mirror? Yeah, I mean. Of course, I didn't know too much about that before the investigation happened. Um, so, you know, me being the a teacher and somebody who loves learning, I asked a lot of questions of these guys, too. And, um, you know, the, the table that we were all sitting around that when they did the seance and the reveal, that was actually a table that belonged to Mary Surratt. Um, her writing desk is also in that room uh, and a candlestick. And so we, we have a few things that belong to her or her family. Um, in the house and then in the visitor center, we have a lot of things um, like uh, jewelry and stuff. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely things around the, the facility, the grounds um, that you could say are relics uh, that could draw energy. And Nicole Paris says, great question, Ryan. We like to give applause to good question. Um, well, you know, let's go back to that then. You, you also have un, um, other items in there. Uh, historic items that aren't necessarily from the Surratt family, but are period pieces. And have you ever noticed that, oh, you know, thinking about it, once we brought in that bed warmer, things got a lot weirder here. I mean, has there been any item that you've introduced into the home, into the museum, that seems to come with its own history, its own haunting? I haven't really heard anything. Most of the, the stuff that's in the house now is what was there when I when I arrived. Um we really haven't had the chance to bring in anything new um, other than me. So um, I don't know. I haven't really, nobody really expressed much of anything about how things changed uh, when stuff was brought in. So that's actually makes me curious. So maybe I might reach out to some of my docents and, and uh, colleagues and see if they've ever recognized or seen or sensed anything uh, when some of the new stuff came into the house. Very cool. Something I'll throw out at you, and I think I mentioned this to you then. You guys should put some CCTV cameras in there. And I think people, listeners like ours, viewers of the show, would gladly pay five bucks a month to have access to watch those streaming cameras 24-7, and especially at night. And maybe even do a contest, whoever witnesses and can get a screen cap of strange phenomena taking place or can give you a time code to go back and examine Maybe you give them a free, uh, free. I survived the Surratt House Museum ghost uh, or yeah. something cool. But you guys might want to consider doing that. I think that'd be a great way to continue to teach history. Yeah, and show the hauntings. Uh, Kayomi says when Cindy writes stuff down in her automatic writing session, is she actually writing words that the spirits are speaking to her? 
Uh, yes, she's writing the things that are coming out. She gets out of her own head, out of her own mind, and just writes what is coming through. And um, and that's it. It's very quick scrawl, and she's, I think, discerning what she's writing and hearing at the same time. Sometimes it looks like chicken scratch to Shane and I, and we might laugh about it, but then if you saw our natural writing ability, we could both be doctors. That's all I'm going to say. Our writing is not very good, so... That could be uh, that could be it. See, Julianne Smith says yes. Paranormal caught on camera, Kobe. It's a Man. great idea. It's a great idea. And honestly, right now with with how much digital and virtual content we need to create, um, that's a sooner than later idea. Well, it's uh, it's an amazing location, a great history, uh, fantastic story, and obviously it was important enough that they decided to keep this. Is it considered a historical? landmark uh now or or is that just because it's a museum no it is um uh now i don't know that it became one until it became a museum because you know you have to apply for things uh and i don't think they ever really considered doing it before it became a museum but yeah we are we are part of um the maryland historical trust um uh we're 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 recognized actually um nationally as a historic site so Mary Allen asks, how can a spirit make footsteps you can hear? How can a discorporate uh, or discorporal uh, figure make sounds? We don't know for sure, Mary. And are we really hearing a dead person walking or are we hearing through time and space? Are we hearing something taking place? Remember, this location exists then and now. So time is always rubbing up against each other. And could things just be in the right moment that we hear those footsteps and the door shutting? And could we be the ghosts to them? Are they trying to go to bed at night and they're hearing us knocking around in there? I don't know. That's that's the cool aspect of the paranormal. Uh, see, Shane Pittman admits my seven-year-old writes better than me. Get to that as well. Uh, Dane asks, what's the history behind your ring that is seen in the intros? Uh, people love the rings, man. I don't know. Shane and I make a joke of it. I've gone out and bought all new rings. This This ring is my wedding ring. Uh, this is my wedding ring. Uh, this is, this is my filler ring. It's angel wings. Uh, my wife and I have matching ones that I wear when I'm out on the road, just kind of depending on my mood, I've got coffins and skulls and, and black onyx. And I've, I've got some protection jewelry. I like to wear when I'm out because I don't know what you weirdos are doing in these haunted locations before we get there. So I want to be prepared. So there's no, I'd like to say there's a deep history. Some of the things just mean something to me. I have a Templar uh, ring that I wear because I got it in France with my daughter. And it's just a, it was something that we shared. She got a ring, I got a ring. So there's just different rings that I wear uh, for different purposes like that. Nothing I can say that's uh, that's really, you know, steeped in, in legend and lore, but uh, maybe if you've got some haunted jewelry you want to send my way, uh, hit me up at daviddarknessradio.com. Maybe you'll see him on an upcoming episode. Or if you're creator of jewelry, maybe I'll wear them in an upcoming episode as well. Um, We've got, uh, I don't know, we've got a lot of, uh, oh, Shane says my rings are awesome. Thank you, buddy. I know we've got a lot of, here, here's a weird moment in history. Dave Schrader hosting, yet there's a Dave Schrader in our room who is from Pennsylvania, not me, Pennsylvania. I've often thought that maybe we are noises and visions to the spirits. Same place, different dimension. Which I think has a lot to say with what we really might be dealing with in some of these situations. I think we had a conversation very similar to that standing outside the house one of the nights of the shoot. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely did. Uh, Kobe, thank you so much. I'm going to throw up again real quickly the uh, banner uh, so people can find more information about it. In, and if you have information that you'd like, you'll find a link for it in today's show. But go to www.suratmuseum.org. That's Surratt, S-U-R-R-A-T-T, museum O-R-G. You'll find more information there and uh, can contact Kobe and the amazing staff um, and, and share your insights and tell them you want those ghost cameras set yeah. up. There. Kobe, thank you so much for coming on and staying up late with us tonight and sharing your wealth of knowledge of history and the haunting of the Surratt Tavern. We really appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Um, thanks for having me. It was great talking with you again and uh, seeing all the questions and, and getting to, to meet some people on, on the question board. So yeah, no, I had a great time. Anytime. 
Very cool. And uh, we'll be back again next week. I'll have more special guests. We'll announce them closer to showtime. And we've got some cool guests that are going to be joining me throughout the season. And yes, poor Shane will be with me soon. I know we did an episode last week with Cindy. We've got Kobe this week. Shane will be joining us again here in the future. We've got other great guests that are going to be popping in from Paranormal Pop Culture, Aaron Sagers. And a couple of special guests I'll I'll keep uh, hidden from you for now. But there will be a few celebrity hidden guests that should be joining us uh, over the next couple of months as each episode airs of The Holzer Files. Immediately afterward, we'll be followed up with Holzer's Ghost After Party, where we talk about the episode. Again, tonight, Season 2, Episode 3, Death to Tyrants at the Surratt museum uh, org go check out all the information be safe be kind love one another remember we'll be back with more of the best in paranormal talk radio next week you've been listening to darkness radio <laughs>